Well, time flies. Uh, it's already six months of the year gone. We are at the second half of 2021. So it's time to do a half year review and an outlook of the second half for the markets. All right, so let's begin with the US markets and let's begin with the S&P 500. So from the beginning of the year, we started over there when the candle opened. And as of yesterday, the 30th of uh, June, we closed at uh, 4297. So the S&P 500 is up 14.41% for the first half of the year. And this has been supported by very strong earnings growth. In fact, most of the companies have beaten earnings by a wide margin. And so that has contributed to the very strong market in the first half. Now, of course, as you know, prices don't go up in a straight line, they move in wave patterns. And so far, the wave patterns have been pretty reliable. As you can see, right? Wave up, wave down, wave up, wave down, wave up, wave down. Very, very reliable. All right, and, and you guys know that as investors, when do we buy? We buy on the wave down, right? So the moment it waves down, it hits a support level, right? We add shares there, hits a support, we add shares there, hits a support, we add shares there. We just keep doing that, and that's how we get in at relatively the lower prices of the market. But again, sadly, most people out there who are not training in investing, you find that the market could go up in the first six months and they still lose money. That's right. So how do people lose money when the market goes up? Very simple, because they keep buying high and selling low, right? And most people, what happens is when they see the market going up and they read all the good news, they say, hey, I wanna make money, and they jump in there. The moment they jump in, what happens, right? Market will drop, they read all the bad news and they sell. So sadly, people who are not trained would always uh, buy there and sell there and buy there and sell there and buy there and they keep losing money again and again. So you guys know from how I've invested for so many years is we do the opposite of everyone else, right? We keep buying uh, when the market drops and we buy when there's bad news and that's how we get in at the best prices. So that's the S&P 500. So What's the outlook for the next six months? We'll take a look in a short while. But so far, first six months up 14.41%. Now, how did the rest of the other two indices do? So if you guys remember, last year, the NASDAQ outperformed the S&P and the Dow because the technology stocks, the stay-at-home stocks uh, did really well and the rest were left behind. Then the first five months of this year, the opposite happened. We had a big sector rotation where now, the cyclical stocks, this, the, the reopening stocks came back and outperformed the technology stocks. So the first five months, the Dow Jones outperformed the NASDAQ. Well, in the last month, now the NASDAQ has come back again. Right? So you find that they take turns uh, leading the market. So what you see right now, as of uh, end of this month, is the market has now converged back together again. That's right, you've got now convergence, right? So again, last year, we had divergence where the NASDAQ went ahead and the Dow was left behind. And first five months, the Dow went ahead, NASDAQ left behind. So now NASDAQ comes back, it's playing catch up, right? So now you see a very nice convergence in the three indexes. And that's the way it's supposed to be. In the long run, the three indexes tend to converge together with, of course, the NASDAQ always having a slight lead because it consists of high growth technology companies. So S&P up 14.41%, NASDAQ just slightly behind, but now it's like catching up at 12.54% and the Dow Jones at 12.73%. If we take a look at the breakdown of the sectors, you can see, sure enough, the last month, technology has now come roaring back. Technology in the last month has become the best performing sector. Energy is still pretty strong, as you can see. Healthcare is coming back. Real estate is coming back, all right? Uh, and if you take a look at the charts over here, again, you can see that for the first six months, which sectors have outperformed? Now, again, this purple one is the S&P 500, okay? So we are always measuring which sectors outperform the S&P, which sectors underperform the S&P. So again, what you're seeing here is the first six months of the year, first half of 2021. 
And you can see again, it has been the cyclical sectors, or we call them the reopening sectors that benefit from the economic reopening, benefit from vaccine that has been outperforming, right? So the best performer this year has been energy. And second, financials, and third, industrial. So energy, financials, and industrials have outperformed the overall market. And the rest have been uh, on par, slightly behind the S&P 500. Now, some people are saying, hey, then I should buy energy, right? I should buy financials, I should buy industrials because they are leading the way. Well, not so fast. Remember, the reason these three sectors have been leading this year is because they have been crap last year. All right, so all they are doing is they are playing catch up. They are not catching up because they've been lagging behind. All right, but the question is, in the long run, do these three sectors actually outperform the S&P 500? <sighs> no. <laughs> in the long run, these three sectors underperform the S&P. Why? Because they are very cyclical and they have lower growth than some of the other sectors. So let's take a look at the long term. If you take a look at the last 10 years, can you guess, guess which sectors consistently outperform the S&P? Let's take a look. All right, so again, there we have the last 10 years. Okay, S&P is right in the middle. So which sectors beat it? Technology. In the long run, technology always outperforms the overall market. Why? Because they have got the highest growth rates because of technology, okay? Number two would be consumer discretionary stocks, also known as consumer cyclical stocks. So these are things like Nike and Estee Lauder and Walt Disney, right? These are the discretionary companies, right? Uh, then in third place, you have got healthcare, which also is a very strong sector in the long run. So you notice that in my portfolio, Ideally, the majority of the companies I want to keep for the long run should be technology, consumer discretionary, and healthcare. These are the ones that I don't really want to sell. I want to hold it for the long run because they're in secular growth industries, right? And you can see in the long run, cyclical stocks like industrials, financials, and materials, and energy, these are very cyclical stocks. They underperform the S&P in the long run. But do we still want to buy them? Yes, only when they're dirt cheap. Only when they're at the bottom of the cycle do I want to buy them. And then once they you know, catch up to the top of the cycle, I could start taking profits. You see the difference right here? So you guys know that last year, when financials, like the banks, insurance companies were in the crapper, when you were doing really badly, we bought all the banks last year, right? And so I really started to sell all my US banks this year. So also but I'm still holding to my Asian banks because the Asian banks are still undervalued or not too overvalued, right? Industrials, same thing. You buy them when they're dirt cheap, like 3M, Honeywell, okay? So these are industrial companies like, uh, like Deer, okay? These are companies that you want to buy when they are really undervalued. Once they're overvalued, then you want to get rid of them. You don't hold them too long because they underperform the S&P uh, in the long run, all right? So I bought 3M last year, I bought Boeing last year, I bought, um, what's the other cyclical one I bought? Darn, I can't remember, anyway. But I've not sold them yet because I think they've got a bit more room to run, all right? As you guys know, I never touch utilities because I think it's too boring, growth is too low, and I, I just don't like it, right? And for me, I never touch material companies. Materials are commodities, right? Right now, you can see that this year, commodities have been booming commodities, but I don't touch commodities because I find it too hard to anticipate the trends because commodities are very unpredictable and companies within the commodity space tend to have very low profit margins because they're in a very competitive industry where there's no one company that dominates that whole industry. And as you guys know, I also tend to avoid energy right? because yeah, in the short term, you can see now energy is doing well. Uh, materials doing well, but in the long term, they don't really do well. So I tend to avoid these because I'm, I'm looking at it from the long term perspective. So again, to summarize in the long term, technology, consumer discretionary, and healthcare outperform the S&P. So in the majority of your portfolio, you want the majority of your stocks to be in these industries, right? 
Oh, I forgot to talk about staples, right? Consumer staples are also known as consumer defensive companies. So what are staple companies? Staples are essential goods like Clorox, like P&G, like Unilever. These are uh, staples, a uh, Kimberly Clark. So normally staples have very low growth, but they tend to be very defensive. In other words, during a recession and a bear market, when the whole market goes down, defensives or staples tend to go up. So they are really good as a way to buffer your portfolio. And I buy them only when they're dirt cheap. So right now, as you know, I just bought Clorox because Clorox is undervalued. Uh, PNG slightly undervalued, still waiting for a lower price. If you can get a lower price, Unilever, I bought it before I sold it for a slight, slight profit. So again, staples are good as a buffer to your portfolio, right? They don't grow your portfolio that much, they are buffer. It's kind of like uh, a balanced meal, right? So protein grows your muscles, but you can't just eat protein because too much protein, you get uric acid, it's unhealthy. You need to balance protein with vegetables and uh, vitamins, right? So staples are like your vegetables, your 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 carbo that balances the growth. It gives you a bit of energy uh, once in a while when you need it. Okay, so being the half year, let's take a look at the PE ratio once again. As you can see, uh, if you look at the overall S&P 500 PE ratio, it still looks bloody expensive, man, right? In the long run, the PE ratio, the price to earnings ratio is about 17 times earnings. And right now the S&P is selling at 37 times earnings. Oh my God. So again, people say we are so expensive, right? Yes, I've said this many times before that in general, if you look at the whole market, it is expensive. Okay, it is expensive. But within that market, there are companies under the hood of the car that are still reasonably priced. Not many left, but there still are. And there are still some companies that are still slightly undervalued. And as you guys know, uh, these are the ones we have been buying. But you have to do a lot of digging to find these companies, right? So that's why personally for me, I won't buy shares of the index ETS right now for me, right? I won't buy shares of the S&P, the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, because I think overall it's expensive, okay? I prefer to buy individual companies that I know are fairly priced. Now, having said that, those of you who are taking a long-term approach to investing, you're doing dollar cost averaging over the years, you want to dollar cost average the index ETFs, sure, you can go ahead, right? But personally, I prefer to buy individual companies. So, for example, within consumer staples, like I said, Clorox was a good deal. We bought Clorox a couple of days ago, right? I shared with you guys in the uh, chat group, right? The, the UIP alerts. PNG looks fairly valued. Pepsi looks uh, slightly undervalued as well. Technology, Microsoft, although it's gone up so much, but Microsoft actually is still uh, not that expensive from an intrinsic value perspective. Facebook has gone up like crazy as well, right? But again, Facebook, I wouldn't say is that expensive as well. It is fairly priced. But again, don't jump in right now to add more. Wait for a wave down, right? Remember, remember buy when there's panic, when there's fear, don't chase the girl, let the girl run to you, right? Uh, Salesforce is still fairly priced, okay? When it comes to healthcare, United Health, still fairly priced. Uh, BDX as well, although that's not on the watch list yet, but I'm still watching to put it on the watch list in a short while. For industrials, Boeing, 3M, they are still fairly priced. Consumer discretionary, Lowe's, we bought uh, bought some shares of Lowe's, as you guys remember, two weeks ago, I sent an alert on UIP as well. Booking.com, Amazon, these are discretionary companies uh, that are still uh, undervalued and fairly priced, right? So there are still some uh, gems around, but not many. Um, so there are still some things to buy along the way. So what were some of the key events that happened this month? Well, one of the significant events was the Federal Reserve, the Fed, during their meeting, announced something quite uh, interesting, right? So initially, the Fed said, don't worry, we're going to keep interest rates at zero. We're only going to raise interest rates in 2024. And don't worry, inflation is you know, short term, it won't go above 2.4%. Anyway, 2.4% is our target, right? So what happened was they came out in um, mid-June, 
I can't remember the date, right? Mid-June, and they said, okay, we can see inflation is getting a bit high, right? So our target for inflation is now 3.4% for 2021. But again, it, it, it won't stay there for long. It's going to come back down. So they have acknowledged that inflation uh, is going up, right? And what they did say is that we are now going to raise interest rates twice in 2023 instead. So they've moved forward their interest rate hikes. So the moment they announced it, guess what? The market panic. Oh my God, they're raising interest rates. Because remember, when you raise interest rates, it's like, it's like hitting the brakes on the car. The car is the economy. So right now the car is going really fast, right? Inflation is going really fast. So right now the Fed is saying, we have to step on the brakes soon. So when people hear step on the brakes, what if you brake too hard and the car stalls? So they panic, oh my God, right? So the market likes to panic. And so the moment it was announced, the market dropped, I think about 1.5%. And again, what do, what do most retail investors do? They sell, oh my God, right? Dumbasses. <laughs> so what do we do? We buy. That's right. So the moment we saw the bad news, we saw the thing crash, we bought, and then hallelujah, it goes up again, right? So the way to make money is to uh, be greedy when others are fearful, to take advantage of their panic, to buy great companies at huge discounts. Because remember this, you can remember this, right? That the market tends to drop when they anticipate interest rates rising. But eventually the market will go higher when interest rates rise. Isn't that interesting? So I'll repeat that again. When people think that the Fed is going to raise rates, they panic and sell. But in actual fact, the market goes higher with interest rates. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Yes, it does. Okay. So remember I showed you this chart before over here? That if you study history, stock prices and interest rates actually trend in the same direction over the long run. Why? Because when the, when the Fed raises interest rates, they are stepping on the brakes, right? Of the car. And why are they stepping on the brakes? Because the car is going really fast. Because the car is, is really, uh, you, know, going, you know, doing really well. So usually the Fed raises interest rates when the economy is uh, booming. And when the economy is booming, guess what? Companies generate more sales and profits and hence the value of their shares rise. So never be afraid of rate rising interest rates in the long run. Short term, you'll drop and that's an opportunity we buy because we know that in the long run, rising rates mean a strengthening economy. Okay. Now, of course, sometimes the Fed gets it wrong and they press on the brakes too hard, your car stalls, right? <laughs> the economy goes into recession. But... But it could happen, but um, it's unlikely to happen because the Fed, you know, they kind of know, tap the brake, tap the brake, don't step too hard on the brakes. The Fed also signaled their intention that they will start to reduce their asset purchases. Currently, the Federal Reserve, they are buying about $120 billion worth of treasuries and agency mortgage-backed securities every month. All right, so they're basically pumping in money to the market every month. They say we're going to reduce that, right? Now, the moment they an announce this news that, hey, we're going to raise interest rates soon, what happened? The US dollar rallied, right? Remember, the moment a country signals their intention to raise interest rates, their currency always strengthens. So the US dollar has rallied and gold always goes opposite of the dollar, right? Dollar goes up, gold goes down. It's always the opposite, right? So gold has had a major correction because of this announcement. Okay, so let's take a look at what's happening to the China market. So while the US markets have outperformed in the first half at 14% return, China has underperformed in the first half because of number one, the, gov the government's uh, intervention into the technology companies. So the government went after Alibaba, went after Tencent, Meituan uh, because of antitrust uh, regulations, right? So because of this climate of intervention, uncertainty, people panic and sold. So the Chinese tech companies have dropped significantly uh, in the first half, dragging down the entire index. And again, as an investor, to me, that's great news because I did a lot of buying of Chinese tech companies. And I'm now holding 
a pretty big portfolio of Alibaba, Tencent, and JD because I expect it to outperform in the second half or if not, next year to come roaring back. The second reason why China's market has uh, not done so well is because um, the Chinese government, they cut their stimulus much earlier than the Americans. So the Americans are still stimulating the economy, keeping interest rates low, pumping in money. But China, once they created the stimulus in last year to help in the pandemic, once they saw their economy recovering, they cut the stimulus very, very fast. So basically, they are doing monetary tightening a lot faster to curb speculation, and that has caused the market to come down, which I think is a good move in the long run because you don't want it to run too fast. You want it to gradually go up in a sustainable pace. So if you look at the Shanghai Composite Index, you can see we started over here in January, and as of now, we are just somewhere over there. So uh, the Shanghai Composite Index is only up 3.4% for the first half of the year, which is way below uh, the US in comparison. Now, let's take a look at the uh, price to earnings ratio of the Shanghai market to take a look at, um, to get a rough feel about whether the market is expensive or cheap. So you saw that in the US, the P ratio is like 37, it's really way above the historical average. But China is the opposite. You can see that historically, the PE ratio for Shanghai has been 37.37. And as of now, the PE ratio is 29.23. So based on the price earnings ratio, Shanghai is undervalued. And by the way, if you're wondering, this is based on normalized earnings, not the last 12 months of earnings. Next, if you take a look at the Hong Kong Hang Seng Index, it has uh, also been underperforming, but slightly higher than Shanghai. It opened over there and closed here on the last day of June. So it's up 5.86% for the first half of the year. And Hong Kong also remains very undervalued. You can see historically, the average price earnings ratio is 18. Right now, it's at 17.76. So how has my portfolios performed versus the S&P 500? Let me just uh, show you. So I've got several accounts. This one is, uh, this account is about $2.3 million account. And it has got quite a big weightage to the China market. So this one did not perform as well. Um, you can go over to the account management, oh, not this one, sorry, uh, account management here. And it will bring you to, again, this account management page. Under portfolio analyst. All right, so year to date return. So year to date, you can see it's a 15% return. And that's only uh, slightly higher than the S&P 500, which is 14%. So to me, it's not that great. Why? Because a big part of this portfolio has got China stocks, a lot of China technology stocks. So that pulled down uh, the great performance of my US stocks. All right, but I'm not too worried because I believe that in the second half, China will come back right? in the second half. And so with that, I believe that at the end of this year, this portfolio should way outperform the S&P. But let's see how it goes. Again, uh, this particular account is this one, which has again, a lot of China exposure. My, my other account has less China exposure, mainly US only, and that has performed uh, slightly better. Let me just show you over here. Yep, so this is about $1 million account over here. And you can go to account, uh, account management over here. All right, there we go. Uh, so you can see it's up 73%. Uh, for the last one year. So year to date, let me just click here, year to date. Yeah, year to date is up 21.62%. So uh, this one has beat the S&P by a better margin because it's got less exposure to China, right? So the point is, 
Some of you, your portfolios may beat the S&P, some may underperform the S&P for the first half. It doesn't matter, all right? It depends on how you've constructed your portfolio. Like I said, uh, China has underperformed the first half, but you never know what's going to happen in the second half. Again, in the second half, if China begins to outperform and catches up to the US and the US pulls back, then you never know my, my first portfolio could then outperform my second portfolio. So it ain't over till the fat lady sings. Happy to also see the many of our uh, fellow traders and investors in the community also beating the market so far for the first, sec first half of the year. So we have got people who have been sharing like William, uh, who said this is my second year after graduating from the Wealth Academy back in January 2019. Uh, and you know, I took a snapshot of my portfolio. My account has tripled in the last two years, right? Two years is up 198%. The last one year up 166% and year to date up 23%. So pretty similar to my portfolio as well. And then we have got uh, Jason who just posted today and he said today is June the 30th or rather yesterday and he's up 42% year to date. Prior to attending the courses, I was a gambler and you know how I performed back then, draining my accounts to the red every year, right? Losing money every year. And then once he used the right methodology, now making 42% uh, year to date. And of course, we've got people like Bagus, who has been following me now for many, many years. And Bagus is amazing. He's up 674% for the last two and a half years and 66% year to date. And again, what's amazing about Bagus is that uh, you know, when he first took my live class back in June 2015, I was running it physically then, and he lives in Jakarta, right? So he said, I must fly to Singapore every Tuesday morning, attend your live class till midnight and back to Changi Airport, waiting for the first flight to Jakarta. So he had to spend, you know, lots of money on traveling, accommodation, and he spent over, over $10,000 on the course at the time, uh, but, you know, nowadays we are able to teach it for a fraction of the course uh, via the, the internet, right? So it's, it's a great time to be alive. And again, many of you would know that many of the students actually get, you know, much higher returns than I do because I don't profess to get the highest returns. I profess to be the most conservative investor you've ever, ever met, right? So there's no right or wrong. If you want to take, be a bit more aggressive, you can get much higher returns, but you need uh, to be able to take a lot more volatility in your portfolio. Okay, so what's my outlook for the markets in the second half? As I always say, no one can predict the future because you can't predict tomorrow's news and how the markets will react to the news. All we can do is we can base it on probability. Now, from a technical perspective, markets are on an uptrend. And as long as they continue to be on an uptrend, the path of least resistance is up. In other words, uh, as markets are now on an uptrend, the US, China, and Singapore, it should continue going higher for the rest of the year. Now, having said that, remember, it won't go up in a straight line, okay? Remember that it will go through wave up, wave down, wave up, wave down. And right now, we are on a wave up in the US markets. So I'm not surprised that we're going to get a wave down, right? A, a correction in the next couple of months, but I foresee that by the end of the year, we should end up higher than where we are today based on historical patterns. So that, that would be based on the technical charts. Uh, fundamentally, US stocks can move higher, uh, driven by a combination of earnings growth. So companies are expected to, again, show great earnings growth in the second half. And the stock market, although relatively expensive to its history, is still attractive relative to bonds. So the S&P earnings yield is still higher than the yield on the treasury bonds, the long-term treasury bonds. And of course, currently we are still at almost zero interest rates that should provide the liquidity for the US markets to continue moving higher. Now, if you take a look a bit at history, you can see from this chart that when the US market uh, makes a positive gain in the first half of the year. As you can see, when the market gains during the first half, there's a 70% chance it would gain in the second half. Now, again, this is based on historical statistics. And this is also the first year of the new presidential term by Joe Biden. Now, 
historically, during the first year of a presidential term, the markets tend to gain at a 65% probability as well. All right, so based on that, uh, and historically, what we've found is that when the S&P gains, uh, say, 10% in the first half, you will tend to gain half of that in the second half. So 10% in the first half, 5% in the second half. So since we gain 14% in the first half, then he, theoretically we should gain 7% in the second half. Again, it's not a sure thing, it's just based on historical statistics, right? Now, however, I think there's a greater potential for the China market to outperform in the second half because it has underperformed in the first half. So I think China has a chance to catch up in the second half. If not, then next year. But we'll see. Okay, particularly, per, particularly because China uh, is projected to grow its earnings at 21%, its uh, companies, uh, versus 8% of global earnings growth. If you take a look at the PEC ratio of the Hong Kong market, again, what is PEC ratio? You divide the PE ratio by the projected growth rate. So remember that the Hang Seng PE ratio is about 17 times earnings, and earnings are expected to grow at 21%. So 17 divided by 21, that gives us a PEC ratio of less than one, which means that stocks are undervalued, all right? At the same time, you, you take a look at global allocation. Global investors are currently under allocated to China equities because of, again, all this uh, negative publicity about China and all those things, right? Uh, but remember, you can't run away from the fact that China is a long-term global growth engine. And eventually, the stock market would reflect the growth of its economy and its earnings. In fact, the China tech, tech sector is expected to grow at 20 to 40% growth rate in the next couple of years. So a lot of uh, catching up for the equity markets to do. Now, there have been a lot of people saying that the reopening play is not fully played out. So what does that mean? That means cyclical stocks like energy and financial stocks and industrial stocks have come a long way to recover this year, but it's not over yet. They still have some way to go upwards, all right? Yes, I agree with that. But having said that, right now, would I jump into the uh, financial stocks and industrial stocks? And commodity stocks, personally, I won't. Because again, remember, in the long run, they underperform the markets. They are just happening to perform well in the short term because of their underperformance last year. So they're playing catch up, right? So I tend to only like to buy cyclical stocks when they are dirt cheap and they are no longer dirt cheap, right? Commodities are no longer cheap. Financials are no longer cheap. Industrials are no longer that cheap, okay? Uh, but again, there are pockets of companies that I think still offer value that can continue to benefit from the reopening of the economy. One of them would be leisure and travel. Now, you guys know I don't invest in airlines because it's a very competitive industry, right? I also tend to avoid hotels because I already have REITs. So for me, there are two main companies I'm looking at to benefit from the uh, travel reopening. Number one is Boeing. And number two is Booking.com. And the third one is actually the Shanghai International Airport that remi remains very undervalued. And that's listed on the Shanghai Exchange, all right? When it comes to financials, I think that US financials, yes, they can still go higher, but I think the upside is already limited because uh, they are uh, not cheap anymore, right? So I prefer to focus on the Asian financials. Hence, I sold most of my US banks, but I'm still holding on to my... Uh, Singapore bank stocks and the China insurance stocks like Ping An Insurance. Energy and materials, yes, they could still have some way to go up, but as you guys know, I tend to avoid these two sectors because they tend to be underperforming in the long run and tend to be very competitive, uh, a very competitive industry with very low profit margins. So I tend to avoid that, right? Uh, so this source is from Bloomberg UBS. You can see uh, they expect a lot more runway for these cyclicals. But again, I would say be selective to the ones that are not expensive yet.
finally, what are the risks that could screw things up in the second half? Uh, well, number one would, of course, if inflation stays really high and doesn't come down like the Fed expects it to come down. So if inflation stays you know, above 3.4% or goes to 4 to 5%, then, well, that could be a bit concerning, right? So high inflation could lead to concerns, again, about the Fed raising interest rates even sooner than expected or cutting their stimulus bond buying program. So if anything happens in that respect, expect short-term volatility. Expect the markets to correct uh, even more in the second half. However, which industries will benefit from higher interest rates? Financial stocks. Okay, and that's why I continue to keep quite a lot of financial stocks, but in Asia as a hedge and beneficiary of higher interest rates. The other thing is I've mentioned in my previous video that if in inflation continues to remain high, I will still do well, and you can still do well if you hold companies that have pricing power, that are able to pass along the, the extra cost to their customers. And you can only do that with companies with sustainable competitive advantage, as well as selected REITs with N, inflation-proof stocks. The second key risk would be uh, as the, the ongoing US-China tensions. If there's any escalation in the tensions, that could cause, again, short-term corrections, which from an investment perspective is good. <laughs> All right? Why? Because geopolitical crises tend to produce a very short-term effect. In other words, markets tend to go down very fast and rebound back even stronger. So that would give us an opportunity to pick up our favorite companies at a huge discount. So there you go, right? Finally, uh, if COVID-19 resurgence happens, especially in the developed world, where now we think everything is more or less under control, if the variants go out of control, then everything flares up again, we go into lockdown again, that could be a key risk. That is why in my portfolio, majority of the companies I have are still the pandemic-proof stocks that will benefit from the stay-at-home culture. Things like Microsoft, Salesforce, Adobe, Amazon. These are companies where even if the pandemic lasts for the next 20 years, they will still, still do really well. Hence, if you look at my portfolio, majority are still within the stay-home, pandemic-proof tech stocks, while the minority would be in the cyclicals and in between would be the defensive companies. All right, so there you go. That's the review for first half 2021 and a quick outlook for the rest of the year. Hope it's been useful, and as always, may the markets be with you. If you want to catch my latest videos, click on the subscribe button right now. Click on the bell so you get instant notifications once I upload my latest video. If you want to check out my online courses, go to piranaprofits.com. We're going to learn how to invest and how to trade the financial markets and create an income from all around the world. If you want to join my live Wealth Academy program, go on to wealthacademyglobal.com and find out more about how you can learn investing and trading live online. This is Adam Koo and may the markets be with you.